Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Marty. I am a senior staff engineer out of the Google office in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm here, here to present our work titled SNAP, a microkernel approach to host networking. Uh, this is work that was primarily developed and productionized by the many names listed here, including my primary co-author on the paper, Mark DeCruyff. So to summarize the work, SNAP is a framework we have developed for developing and deploying packet processing modules in support of our uh, various packet processing needs at Google. The goals are both performance and deployment velocity. We take inspiration from a microkernel with a user space approach that I will uh, discuss. SNAP has been in uh, wide scale production use at Google for over a few years now. It supports the needs of several systems, including some of which have already been published, including Andromeda, which is a networking virtualization layer for our Google Cloud platform, Espresso for edge networking, and now does traffic shaping functions for our bandwidth enforcer. And in this work, we present a new use case, which is a full-fledged uh, host communication stack, including a reliable transport. Uh, we call that work Pony Express. Uh, with Pony Express and Snap, uh, we're able to demonstrate uh, significant performance improvements compared to our baseline of kernel TCP. And more importantly, we're, we, we demonstrate weekly releases into our fleet. This is the outline for the rest of my talk. I'll first discuss more motivation and put our work into context with two other approaches. I'll highlight some design points, uh, highlight some evaluation, including some of our ongoing challenges, and then I will conclude. So a primary motivation our work, of our work is the ability to develop and deploy new features into our fleet. This diagram shows, over the course of a year, all of the different versions of SNAP that we have deployed into our fleet. Each color represents a different version. We target weekly releases. For the most part, we manage to hit weekly releases, except for cases where we have unplanned uh, freezes due to bugs. In some cases, we have to roll back. Or in planned production freezes, for example, around the holiday time. Now, the conventional approach for implementing networking functionality is to put this into a monolithic kernel, such as Linux. The problem with Linux, or one of the problems with Linux, is development velocity. Not only is developing kernel code, code harder, it draws on a smaller pool of, of software engineers. More challenging is, is how we put new kernels onto our fleet. For every machine in our fleet, we have to drain the running applications of VMs. We have to drain and migrate those to other machines, push a new kernel onto a machine, and reboot the machine. And because of that disruption, we have to significantly pace our rollouts such that it takes on the order of months to get a new kernel version entirely rolled out to our fleet. In terms of performance, the kernel stack is quite good, actually. It, it's very robust, which is why it's still the, the, uh, the most widely used stack probably in, in the majority of the data centers out there. However, for demanding use cases, some of the, uh, some of the overheads from system calls and fine-grained synchronization and how the kernel stack uh, does interrupts and software interrupts are starting to show. So performance has been the primary driver for a lot of recent work in OS bypass. In particular, a library OS approach puts packet processing functionality into libraries linked in directly into applications. In terms of deployment velocity, this can actually be worse than a monolithic kernel. And the reason why is because different application groups at Google have vastly different release cycles. Some application groups release weekly, others will go up to a half year before pushing a new version onto the fleet. Which means that if you are responsible for, the, for a portion of the networking library, it can take a long time for it to, to be completely rolled out. Now, OS bypass and library OSs can be very fast, as uh, a lot of prior work has shown. But sometimes this work makes assumptions that's not really realistic for us. For example, assuming that every application is able to devote a spin polling thread is something that's not really realistic for, for how, we, um, how we multiplex applications onto our machines at Google. Some applications are bursty, others are very light users of the network. Uh, we don't often know that uh, when we, uh, for example, link in a library into an app. 
Not only that, but a library OS approach loses the benefits of centralization because there's no single point to implement uh, scheduling, multiplexing, fairness policies. And a lot of that policy is delegated to the NIC. So our approach takes inspiration from a microkernel and that we implement packet processing functionality in user space. However, it's a separate user space process. And other applications on the machine will interact with the SNAP user space process through inter-process communication techniques. In terms of deployment velocity, this is very good. We have our, our SNAP uh, binaries entirely decoupled from the application and kernel binaries. And we're able to push weekly releases into the fleet because, because we have a transparent upgrade process. When it's time to upgrade SNAP, while the old version of SNAP is still running, we bring up the new version, and then we iteratively transfer state from the old version to the new version, and then cut over. In terms of performance, SNAP can be very fast. We are leveraging kernel bypass, and a lot of the overheads that uh, inflicted some early microkernel work go away with, with modern hardware such as many core CPUs. With many core CPUs, we're not necessarily incurring context switching, and even when we do, modern hardware is pretty good with, with things like tag TLBs. A microkernel also maintains the centralization of a kernel so that we can implement whatever rich uh, fairness, scheduling, and multiplexing policies we want. I'll now discuss some more of the high-level design of SNAP. Here's a high-level figure. SNAP is in the middle. It consists of a control plane and a data plane. In terms of users of SNAP, that's shown at the top. Um, some, some users of SNAP, for example, is a hypervisor. Other users are, are applications that, uh, that will interact, for example, with, with different engines, which is the key data plane element of SNAP. And the figure shows we have different engines to do different things. For example, we have uh, engines to implement uh, packet processing pipelines for virtualization, engines that may implement a full-blown reliable transport, and an engine that, for example, implements traffic shaping. So an engine is our units of code. It, it pretty much exposes a, a run method, which is then invoked by uh, engine threads. It's also our units of CPU scaling, which I'll discuss shortly. And we write engines in a way to, to make it as real-time as possible, for example, by avoiding blocking locks and paying very close attention to how we interact with control plane threads. In terms of the data plane, uh, most of the interaction between these components is through uh, memory mapped I.O., uh, whether that's a memory mapped I.O. to an OS bypass NIC or memory mapped I.O. with application APIs through uh, lock-free shared memory rings. Now, the issue of scheduling SNAP engines is very important, and the most straightforward way to do this is to dedicate cores. This simple picture, for example, depicts uh, two cores dedicated to running SNAP, and then the other cores are running a mix of, of application code or just idle time. And this is simple, straightforward, performs very well uh, with under known load conditions, and works best for some situations. The problem with this approach, however, is that if you provision the number of dedicated cores for the worst case, it's pretty wasteful. And if you provision for the average case, it's gonna lead to high tail latency when you have bursty conditions. So we have been working heavily on dynamically provisioning CPU resources based on actual load. We have two high-level techniques for, for doing this. The first we call spreading engines. In this case, we bind each engine to its own unique kernel thread, and we rely on kernel scheduling to spread those across the machine. However, we do leverage a new uh, kernel scheduling class we implemented called MicroQuanta in order to schedule tighter tail latency. It does rely on interrupts, either triggered from the NIC uh, or from an application to essentially schedule engines on demand. The pros of this, approach, of this approach is that it can actually provide the best tail latency when there's a lot of schedulable engines. The downside is that there are some scheduling pathologies, which I'll discuss, as well as overhead from context switching when you are time splicing the uh, various cores uh, with application work. And so another technique we implement is compacting engines, which tries to compact engines to as few cores as possible with a cooperative uh, scheduling runtime. We rely on periodic polling of queuing delays to rebalance engines to more cores as needed, and this works uh, similar to uh, the Schnangle work that was uh, published earlier this year. This can provide the best CPU efficiency, 
because when engines are compacted down to few cores, those cores essentially become specialized with hot branch predictors, hot caches, and so forth. The downside is that when there are a lot of engines and a lot of dynamic scaling activity, there can be some, some tail latency issues from detecting the queue buildup in order to push, minute, push engines out. So Snap enabled us to develop a, a new host communication stack that we call Pony Express. The goal here is performance. This implements a reliable transport and interface. The interface is an RDMA-like operation, or it's a, it's a RDMA-like interface to applications based on asynchronous command and completion queues. Uh, it implements two-sided messaging for things like uh, RPC. We also implement one-sided operations such that we can access remote data from a remote machine without invoking the application thread scheduler on that machine. This is very similar to how one-sided operations in RDMA works. However, because Pony Express is software, we can go beyond remote memory reads and writes by implementing custom one-sided operations to make it even more robust. For example, to avoid pointer chasing over the fabric by specifying a remote index into an indirection table rather than a remote memory address. So Pony Express integrates into existing stacks at Google, like gRPC, or new use cases that, for example, take advantage of these one-sided operations. And the, the other aspect of Pony Express is that we do take advantage of, of uh, offloads, particularly stateless offloads. And even if we have stateful offloads that become more robust for data center usage, we think that operating these from a microkernel like Pony and, and Snap uh, is a good way of doing things. So I'm now going to move into some evaluation highlights, particularly with, uh, with the uh, Pony Express Snap engines. The goal here is to beat TCP. I'm showing some simple two-node benchmarks to show the latency. On the left is the kernel TCP stack, which has a baseline of about 23 microseconds for a ping pong. And it can busy pony. You can see the impact there. And then depending on in snap pony on whether the application uh, busy poles or not, we can get as low as eight microseconds, which is pretty good for a data center environment for accessing end-to-end uh, -end data transfer from uh, applications. In terms of throughput, this shows uh, you know, a single, like, like the prior slide, this is a single Pony engine running on a single dedicated core. Our baseline kernel has, uh, performs on the order of 24 gigabits per second with a single active stream. That falls off quite a bit when there are 200 active streams. Uh, the Snap Pony results uh, do pretty good, uh, and it doesn't see that same fall off. And then if we go to a, a larger MTU, and if we take advantage of a mem copy offload engine that exists in most Intel processors, we're getting on the order of 75 or 80 gigabits per second with a single core and a single Pony engine, which is pretty efficient. Uh, this is a production dashboard illustrating how um, we're able to do these one-sided operations at a very high rate for a real production workload. This is a large-scale data analytics application at Google. And on the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is over the hottest minute. We plot the machine. We, we, we basically show the number of IOPS that the hottest machine in the cluster is, is uh, doing. With a single express engine, a uh, single Pony Express engine with a single core, we see uh, spikes of over 5 million uh, operations performed per second. So all those memcached D papers you've seen that uh, you know, showcase many millions of key value accesses per second, here is a production use case. Now, a lot of our ongoing work deals with the issue of dynamic scaling. On the left, we are dynamically scaling 10 different Pony Express engines at an offered load of 80 gigabits per second. This is basically a, a rack local benchmark where we've got uh, dozens of machines communicating with each other, uh, exchanging one megabyte uh, RPCs with a Poisson distribution so we get some burstiness. And the compacting engine scheduler shows over a 3x efficiency advantage compared to the baseline stack uh, kernel TCP stack at our organization. On the right, we vary the background offer load on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, uh, I show the 99th percentile latency of an RPC probing application running on the same machines. And we see that in this experiment, we show that the spreading engine scheduler offers the lowest tail latency. So on the left, we see the compacting offers the best CPU efficiency. On the right, we see that the spreading offers the best tail latency. However, the spreading scheduler does rely on interrupt-based wake-up, and that's got some poor interactions with things like processor-saving C states or uh, other things, for example, like, like non-preemptible kernel activity. Uh, this graph uh, shows the impact of C states when we're under low load. 
And you can see that the 99th percentile of the spreading engine scheduler is significantly impacted by C-states with the second set of bars. The third set of bars turns off uh, most of the C-states except for the uh, C0 and C1. And then on the right, it shows the compacting engine scheduler where everything is compacted down to a single core because it is lower load. And uh, the way we usually do compacting engines is that as a single core, we always spin pull uh, with a minimum of one core to keep the, uh, the, the processor powered up. So in conclusion, our microkernel approach to host networking has some nice properties. It achieves the iteration speed advantages of user space development and essentially microservices. We get many of the performance gains of OS bypass. We maintain the centralization advantages of a traditional OS kernel. And importantly, we interoperate with the rest of our Linux ecosystem, including our application threading models which is uh, an issue that also a lot of prior work um, wants to change. And we don't require that change with our approach because interoperability is a big deal at Google. And with that, I conclude. Ken, Ber Ken Berman, I, I, I really like this a lot. So um, if... Uh, if I use um, MPI uh, over various interconnects, it runs through something called libfabrics, and that gives a kind of universal switch. Would it be possible to do that kind of an embedding with SNAP and run, run libfabrics over SNAP side by side with Omnipath and RDMA and TCP and so forth? Yeah, libfabric makes a nice intersection work, particularly with uh, HPC stacks like MPI. Uh, it, it is, you know, something we're, we're looking at um, in order to uh, make uh, SNAP, and particularly Pony Express, uh, interoperate more with uh, existing stacks like MPI. So yes, we're looking at that. And Derecho. Derecho is my system, and, and we run over that too. It, it, gives, it gives a beautiful kind of interoperability. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Darren from Facebook. Uh, I thought this was pretty cool as well. I'm just curious, is any of this open sourced, or are there any plans for Google to open source this? Yeah, at Google, we, you know, we, we care strongly about open source. We open source uh, a lot of work, uh, you know, ranging from gRPC to TensorFlow. Uh, we've had those discussions. Um, it's uh, not something that's going to happen anytime soon, but we, you know, hope at some point we can uh, make the case and get the resources to consider open sourcing it. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Thank you very much, Mike. Yep.